Hi, everyone, and welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Amy Milne, Executive Director of the Quilt Alliance. Thank you for joining us as we present the second interview in our QSOS 25th Anniversary Impact Series. So glad you could make it. Uh, Textile Talks, as you probably already know, is a weekly series presented on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Um, Eastern Time in partnership with the Quilt Alliance and our three partner organizations shown here, International Quilt Museum, Studio Art, Qu Studio Art Quilt Associates, or SACWA, and Surface Design Association. All textile talks are recorded and available via YouTube, and at some point, my colleague Lucy Shaken will enter the link for the Textile Talks YouTube recording playlist in the chat box, so look for that. The Quilt Alliance's mission is to document, preserve, and share the stories of all quilts and all quilt makers. Today, we're going to present a demonstration of our longest running oral history project, Quilters Save Our Stories, or QSOS, um, which is a collection of oral history interviews with quilters archived with our partners at the Library of Congress um, and also at the University of Kentucky at the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History. QSOS was launched 25 years ago, uh, which is amazing to think about. And then the Quilt Alliance just celebrated our 30th anniversary, but QSOS was started in 1999 and is not only the largest collection of interviews with quilters, um, but also the largest grassroots oral history project of its kind in the world. So yay quilts and quilters. Um, to find out more about the Quilt Alliance and the QSOS project, you can visit our website and consider becoming a member or a donor. We rely on this kind of community support to carry out our important mission, uh, both for fuel and advice and volunteers and um, combined energy. So please, please consider it. Um, I want to give you a quick reminder, if uh, you can, please use the Q&A box today for questions for our speakers and use the chat box for greetings, um, comments, um, any, you know, tech questions you have. And we've got the um, closed caption feature uh, enabled. If you prefer, prefer not to view the captions, you should be able to turn them off by finding the CC or live captions button uh, or going into your settings uh, is usually the case on a notebook um, device or phone. And I do want to mention that the video, uh, the recording of the interview you're going to see is a recording we're going to be playing back. So the volume will, I'll be turning the volume up as high as I can get it. Um, so you may need to adjust the volume on your device if it's not loud enough for you. We are thrilled to have and honored to have Dolores Vitero Presley and Adana Richardson here today to share the recording that they conducted and recorded this past Monday. And afterwards, we're gonna hold a live Q&A session and uh, I'll invite them to come on uh, after the video plays. But first I'd like to give a, a short introduction um, to, for each of them. Uh, Dolores Vitero Presley never planned to be a fabric artist. I think that's such a great start to an artist's bio. She just wanted to make a quilt for her newborn granddaughter. Quilting allows me to leave a part of me with my loved ones. Dolores is a charter member of the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland and currently serves as the guild treasurer and historian. Our interviewer today, Adana Richardson, is a quilter and quilt historian. She creates traditional and art quilts along with historical replicas and uh, quilts of African-American children's stories. The quilts of G's Bend were the greatest inspiration for her interest in African-American quilt history. When Adana realized most African-American quilts 
had no recorded history about the quilt or the quilt maker, she began documenting the history of African-American quilts to preserve their social and cultural significance. And this eventually led her to establish a nonprofit to document, research, and preserve African-American quilt stories and history. Adana is the founder of the African-American Quilt Documentation Study Group and serves as treasurer of the Quilt Alliance Board. Um, this QSOS interview is, is really special. It marks the second interview, as I said, in the QSOS 25th Anniversary Impact Series of quilt documentation with communities of quilters who are currently underrepresented in the QSOS collection, and this includes African American quilters. Um, so I've got a little uh, sh slides here to share sort of the the um, the goals of this project and the fact that we did receive NEA National Endowment for the Arts funding to do this project, and we have another um, partner funding partner, which is the Teresa Durier and Jimmy Wong Family Foundation. We're so proud to have that support, and in this. Uh, interview today, Adana is not only the interviewer, but she's also a lead artist and partner in this project. And I can't wait to share more with you about this project as we go along. But Adana um, really generously agreed to be an advisor and a lead person on this um, project because she's particularly interested in working with and documenting African-American guilds. And so her interview with Dolores includes a focus not only on Dolores's creative work, which is really impressive on its own, but also a focus on the guild and community activities that she and her fellow guild members have uh, and have undertaken and continued to uh, to accomplish. So I'm going to go ahead and play the video, and then afterwards we'll have Dolores and Adana come on for some questions. Okay. Well, welcome. My name is Adana Richardson, and I am the founder of the African American Quilt Documentation Study Group. The African American Quilt Documentation Study Group is a platform committed to documenting, researching, and preserving African American quilt history. Our organization also collaborates with other organizations with like minded missions and goals. And the Quilt Alliance is one such organization. The Quilt Alliance's mission is to document, preserve, and share American quilt heritage by collecting stories about quilts and their makers. And we are happy to share our audios with the Quilt Alliance in achieving both our goals for 2024. And so, okay. Um, this is going to be the first of many interviews we hope to conduct with African American Quilt Guild throughout the United States. Today, we have invited the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland to join us. This is their 25th year, and they are still relevant and an integral part of their community. As their spokesperson and one of the charter members of the Guild, I'd like to introduce you to Dolores Presley. And I want to start by thanking Dolores for agreeing to represent her Guild and to share with us some of her insights and experiences today. And so Dolores, um, why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you first became interested in quilting? Okay, thank you for having me, Adana. Oh, my I started pleasure. quilting. I, I'm i not a longtime quilter. I started quilting probably in the year uh, 1999. Mm -hmm. I had a granddaughter born in 1998 and wanted to leave something that I had made for her, especially for her. And I was walking, I, I live near a senior center, so I was at walking by the senior center and they had posted quilting classes. So I picked up a flyer. I have a sister who was also a charter member. Um, 
who is a quilter, had been quilting for 30 years. So I thought, well, she might be interested. And she said, well, why don't you come with me? Mm -hmm. And just in one visit, mm -hmm. I got hooked. The um, teacher was Esther Poncho. She was a home economics teacher on the reservation. She lived on the reservation and she had such wonderful stories and just had sage wisdom, it seemed. I don't want to stereotype her, but it was like sage wisdom. And she mm -hmm. would say things like, oh, you could never do it wrong because it's yours and your heart is in it. And who cares if the, the points don't match? So mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's me. You know, if I could make a quilt and make you smile, that's all I want to do. I, I, you know, don't ask me to be technical. I mm -hmm. don't take things out. I act like that's how I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And also I learned from uh, Esther uh, in the woven blankets. If you look at the third row, there's always a mistake because only the gods are perfect. And I mm -hmm. know I'm far from a god. So that's how I got started, trying to make a quilt for my infant granddaughter. I got so, so involved in it, it ended up a queen size, queen size bed spread. We'll from a baby quilt? I, I won't let her take it home. <laughs> and it was all done by hand. And I thought, well, this is going to take me you know, three years to do this. And I think I completed it in less than three months. Oh, nice. And so, yeah, I, I just got so involved with this. I used, before quilting, I used to play golf, which, you know, you go to the golf course and you're gone for, three, you know, five or six hours. I gave up golfing to pursue quilting to, you know, much to my husband's delight. <laughs> he didn't have to play with me anymore, but, uh, that's how I just, I always knew there was an artist in me, but I never knew what to do. I tried a lot of things. I tried some glass windows. I tried tap dancing. I mean, anything that was artful, I said, I know I'm an artist somewhere. So finally, I think, uh, yeah, I was, I was at the age of over 50, retired, had time to do this, and I found inner person oh wow um my next question for you is um i had asked you to bring a quilt or to show us a quilt and i'm assuming that's a lovely piece of work that you have behind you Thank can you. you um tell us a little bit about the quilt like why you made it um, is there a story behind it that you can share yes there is uh, I get my inspiration from stories, from, from, from traveling. We used to travel a lot. This quilt uh, represents my father. He was a party boat fisherman out of Berkeley. And uh, first of all, there were four, four daughters. And then, you know, there's maybe 11, 12 years between me and the next two. Uh, so every Sunday, we would get in the car, my mother, the four girls, my father, and we always ended up looking at water or had to do something with fit. So this, I can't remember how many blocks are in this, but all except two are of fish. Uh, my dad's in two of the blocks, the photos in two of the blocks. Um, and I know my love for water and being around water and in the water comes from my dad from mm -hmm. going out on his, his party boat with him and fishing. I'd like to move on to a little bit of the history about the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland. And I understand that you are one of the charter members of the guild. Um, can you share a brief story behind the founding of the guild of, um, and just let us know how it came to be? I know we had a short conversation about it. Um, the other week when we were together, but I'd like you to share that with everyone. It was so interesting. Okay. Uh, it started at the senior center. The instructor there was Esther Poncho, uh, and she had moved up from Los Angeles where she had been a member of the LA, um, I can't remember the name, but it was the African American Quilt Guild. And she saw that there was some interest 
you know, she put out a flyer and I was surprised how many people showed up to, to uh, learn how to quilt mm -hmm. and decided, let's start a quilt guild. Uh, originally, there were only seven of us in mm -hmm. the year 2000 when we started. Esther, myself, and my sister Julia, our mom, uh, and there were two other sisters and someone who just kept coming to the uh, to the free lessons. And finally, we just talked her into joining. Um, we did everything we could to get our names out there. We did mm -hmm. things, of, quite a few things at the Oakland uh, Museum. Mm -hmm. Had a table, showed them how to make nine patches or just showed them our quilts. Whatever we could do, we went to churches, we went to uh, senior centers, centers and senior residences and mm -hmm. had like a trunk show. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that many quilts, but we were just all over the place, the seven of us. Wow. Uh, sometimes um, you draw fit in one par. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like fun. It, it, was, it, does. It, it fun. does. It sounds like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you this. Um, I, and I know that there were some, I mean, you're, you're starting off in an organization. What were some of the um, challenges um, that um, the Guild faced in those early days? What were some of the challenges that, and, and what, how did you guys overcome them? Well, the, ch the biggest challenge was there were only seven of us mm. and, and we really spread ourselves in. Uh, I think of the seven, four of us were retired, so and you know, looking for something to do anyway. Mm -hmm. um, one was funding. We didn't know anything about grants. Mm -hmm. uh, I did know I was a member of the East Bay Heritage Culture, so a big guild coming out of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I knew about, you know, talked about grants, but we didn't know how to go after grants, what we needed to do. And I spoke to a lot of my friends there and was told the first thing we had to do was become a nonprofit. So that took a couple of years to become a nonprofit. We were a publicly supported organization. That happened in about 2002, 2003, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. It involved a lot of paperwork, which was discouraging because you know, it was like, who's going to do it? Who's going to keep up with it? Right. And finally, I was elected because my husband was an accountant. And for some reason, they thought he knew how to read better than the rest of us. Okay. So he helped me through the process. And we got our nonprofit okay. Great. Uh, status then. Yeah. And once we got that, it just opened up the doors to what was available for us. We could go to organizations and uh, ask for grants. Most of these places gave grant writing lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of that. And that's how we started accumulating funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, in addition to some of the challenges, um, I'd like to know about some of the notable achievements of the Guild. Um, this is your 25th year. That in itself is a notable achievement. Um, but um, are there any other achievements that you would like to share? I think we we made a name for ourselves mm -hmm. with uh, what we call our community relations. Yes. Any yes. school, any Girl Scout troop, any Boys and Girls Club, Anyone who would ask for volunteers to come out and teach quilting or sewing or whatever, we were there. And of course, this was after our membership had grown. This was mm -hmm. by the fifth and sixth year. Mm -hmm. Our membership had grown to maybe 50 people. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were always there. They could count on us. We had our little, you know, dog and pony show. We would take our sewing machines. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us, we didn't even let the, the students, you know, sew on our machines. Mm -hmm. We just volunteered for everything that came our way. And we were fortunate that we have uh, several school teachers in the guild. So they knew when teachers wanted classes on, uh, especially during Black History Month, mm -hmm. come and show quilts and talk to the students. 
So we had a, a regular gig going, especially oh, okay. in, in the month of February. And sounds like it. Yeah, you know, at least every other month we were rotating through a school or a Girl Scout troop or or doing something, and we were picking up members along the way. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you you were all very engaged, um, very committed, and very busy. It, that's what it sounds like to me. Um, I wanted to um, talk about your community involvement, um, but you've just, uh, you know, I've uh, come there to the guild meetings. I've seen some of the things you've done. Um, I have some more pictures to share with you from uh, the quilt documentations that we've been doing. Um, and I'll come back to community engagement in, in, in a little bit here. But let me ask you, um, I'm going to go back around to your anniversary, which okay. is a big deal to the 25th year. I, I next, don't next know, year will be the 25th next year. Next year will be the 25th uh -huh. year. And there are plans being laid now for that. Do, could you share some of those with us? You know, I really, we, we don't have plans yet. We have a lot of ideas. Ah, okay. And due to, you know, board members being ill and, and mm -hmm. things just like, we mm -hmm. haven't met to discuss, you know, exactly what we're going to do, but it's going to okay. be something big. Well, I can't wait to see it. And, and I'm, and I may have you back just to, to, to talk about that event, because I know it's going to be something awesome. Okay. I know it is. Um, well, then let me ask you this. What do you hope will be the legacy of the guild and how would you like to see it continue on into the future? Well, I really enjoy the community relations part of the guild. Mm -hmm. Um, I am still doing classes out in the Hayward area, and I don't know how I ended up in Hayward when I live in Oakland, but they, they seem to be the ones who want people to come to the libraries, come to the senior centers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have the Hayward Arts Council, and they're very active. Mm -hmm. And so I hooked up with them maybe five, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and have been one of their steady supporters. Okay. So I have been doing a lot of teaching through them, at least at least two or three workshops every year. Mm -hmm. uh, they offer uh, also offer uh, venues where you could display, and mm -hmm. I love to display. Uh, I have two quilts down here that my head was down when you first came on. I'm putting the binding on. I have to deliver these next week. <laughs> so. You want to share those two? I'll share them with you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, for me, I get such enjoyment teaching the children or teaching the seniors or just teaching yeah. uh, quilting. Mm -hmm. And it's not your, you know, we tell them this is not your grandmother's quilting. You know, we're going to make potholders. We're going to make wall hangings. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And and it's just enjoyable for me. Oh. I know we got a small reputation from that because uh, there's a school here in Oakland, Glenview School, who had us for three years in a row where we taught every student in their student body to quilt. This was from pre-K to grade five. Pre-K and K, they were just coloring squares or picking fabrics on pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. But everyone made some kind of quilt to take home and the fifth graders would make something for themselves and something for the school. Mm -hmm. And so I recently, well, at one of the ANMO events, the teacher that, the art teacher who was there at the time we volunteered, sent me some more photos and the quilt is still hanging in the school, the school's office. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, and it just brings it just brings a lot of joy to me that you you guys have really embedded your legacy into the com community there in Oakland, I, and I can see that in the short time that I've been with you. Um, do you have any goals? I mean, you 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 folks do a lot, but are there any goals that you would like to see realized, or something that you haven't done yet that you would like to expand on? Well, for me. Personally, no. I'm 
I'm 81 years old. I'm getting a little tired. Okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I can't, uh, we I all can't, are. Yeah, I can't keep up. Don't yeah. ask me for any new ideas. You know, I, I can't <laughs> expend those brain cells. <laughs> I'm thinking of something new. Let, yeah. let me keep what I have. <laughs> okay, okay. I uh, totally understand that. I do. I totally do. I am. Um, well, then let's move on. Let's move on to the promotion of quilting arts. And um, you've already talked a little bit about this, but how does the Guild encourage skill development and artistic expression among the Guild members? I mean, is there, do you bring in teachers? Do you, does someone have a specific talent and they share that with the Guild? I mean, how does the Guild go about encouraging skill development so people aren't just doing one thing all the time? I mean, we all quilt our own way and have mm -hmm. our own favorite way of doing things. But, um, you know, it's always good to expand and grow as far as the quilting arts is concerned. So does the Guild have any um, um, programs in that area? Or what What is their vision for that? Well, we do all of that. Mm -hmm. Our current president is Ann Robinson, and she's mm -hmm. very big on she is. She is. Mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. And her emphasis during her, her, she has been president previously, mm -hmm. and her emphasis at that time was teaching the basics, teaching mm -hmm. the basics to everyone. We also have enough members now, and usually during the year, we, we do get some kind of stipends. So we could afford to have outside people come in and teach classes. I see. And we've done that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then we had, uh, we probably still have, like some professional people who are making a living quilting. I mm -hmm. don't know if you know Patricia A. Montgomery. She used to be a member of our guild, the late Marion Coleman. Mm -hmm. uh, there's someone, Jackie Houston. They had advanced skills and mm -hmm. they were more than willing to share, you know, their talents with the rest of us. Mm -hmm. so we've had classes during the meeting. We've had things outside of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, we had several small groups mm -hmm. and I belong to a small group. We call ourselves the so-and-sos. We've gone through about oh, three, or four, three or four different cute. names. The but so and so's. The I'm so writing and -so's. that one down. The so and so's. That the is so and so's. And uh, there's 10 of us. We started with eight. We went up to 12. We backed to 10. 10 because 10 people could usually fit around your dining room table. Yeah. And yeah. our goal is to exchange skills, to critique each other's work, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for, so all of us could reach a higher level. So wow. what you're looking at now is a quilt I made in 2011, 2011. And I was still making pattern quilts. What I'm working on now, I'll show you. And, uh, you know, never thinking I was creative. And, and, and now I'm told I'm an art quilt. Wow. You know, who would have known? Let's take a peek. <laughs> okay. Um, this one is from the small group, the so-and-sos, we did a round robin. So oh. I sent out this little piece of fabric and its attachments. Mm -hmm. And four other people had to add to it. And then you make a quilt. So, so everybody's making a quilt with the same fabrics, but they're just doing Oh, no. Everyone thing. sends out their own piece of fabric. Wow. or, you know, whatever it is you want to send out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I haven't named this yet, but uh, I like it. <laughs> I like it too. And it's got all my favorite colors in there. I love black. I love red. Um, you could just funnel that my way the next time. <laughs> <laughs> the next time I'm at a guild meeting. It's Our, gorgeous. Maybe, maybe we will get you to join the so-and-sos and you can make your own. <laughs> oh, well, I, I may just do that. I may just do that. Okay. Um, okay. And then the second one, it's a combination of being maybe an art quilt and a traditional quilt. A friend, well, a friend, Marsha, went to South Africa. 
and brought back this embroidery piece for me. Mm -hmm. She also brought back the story, which was in two languages. And I tried to find out what the original language was, and I, I just couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had a translation. So this is what I'm putting together now. Oh so my. this backing is a traditional uh, crazy quilt pattern. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you kind of art it up by putting all your embellishments on. Okay. So when do you plan to have that one finished? This one will be hanging at the Hayward Library mm -hmm. uh, the end of February. Okay. February and March. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I, I My mind is sitting here thinking, I don't know how she does all of this. I just, I, my mind is just constantly going over everything, hanging yeah. on every word. And I'm thinking, how does she do all of this? But <laughs> I, 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 someone I, told me years ago, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That, that is so true. That is so true. Busy people tend to always have something going on and they do always get things done. They do. That is so true. Well, we talked a little bit about education and mentorship, but um, do you have any other, um, um, does the Guild engage in any other educational initiatives or mentorship programs um, like to pass on um, the quilting skills and the traditions to our younger future generations? Well, every February, and we've been doing this for at least 22 years. And you're getting ready to do one this Saturday, I understand. Uh, right? No, in February, our Black mm -hmm. History Month, uh, Black History Month Family Workshop. Oh, mm -hmm. And that's when we have door prizes. We Everyone gets a kit, uh, needle thread, fabric, whatever they need to make a nine patch and they come to West Oakland Branch Library, and we will show them how to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. We've been doing that for at least 22 years. That's something Mr. Poncho started. And so that's an ongoing, that, that, that's what I meant by your guild is still relevant and still yes. doing things here leading into your 25th year. Okay, now, and I, then I, what, what I have been doing, the so-and-sos have been doing, uh, we're out at Hayward teaching these same classes. And mm -hmm. we we are the so-and-sos, but we always let them know we're a mini group of the African-American Quilt Guild of Oakland. But mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we're a crew now and we just, I don't think half of the guild members know we're doing it. We're, we just go and do it. Well, speaking of the guild members, um, membership growth and retention. How many members do you, or roughly, how many members are in the guild today? We have, I think we're approaching 60. 60, okay. 60. Is high, that the highest? The membership? highest we had was 100. Mm -hmm. And that's when Marion Coleman, was our exhibits chairperson, and we had our quilt display, uh, neighborhoods coming together, quilts around Oakland. Mm -hmm. And every public building that would offer a space for free, mm -hmm. uh, we had quilts hanging. Mm -hmm. And so we had people joining the guild uh, <laughs> because they just yeah. thought, this, this, is a, this is a great idea. Yeah. It, we published it, it, a, a catalog, which we immediately sold out the catalog, and mm -hmm. we just didn't realize how successful the, it was going to be. We were trying to save money because for uh, we had had a one-day show, and the cost of doing that, not just the monetary cost, the physical labor to hang it and then take it down, was just yes, you know it's exhausting it's it costly was exhausting. and mm -hmm. it is exhausting it is so to attract new members or to retain the existing ones um 
had you thought about maybe doing another catalog? We're going to have pictures. We're going to, you know, you guys are still doing things. We just did a couple of, I think I documented 13 quilts Saturday mm -hmm. at the African American Museum and Library there in Oakland for, from your guild. And I'm going there again this Saturday to document some more. Um, and there will be some pictures and stories with these. So, you know, we may need to talk at a different time about I think, maybe doing I, something. You know, I think that could be a joint effort. Uh, yeah, we will mm -hmm. expand on that. I'd be more than happy to to work with someone on that. Um, let me ask you this: Do does the guild partner or collaborate with other uh, quilting or cultural organizations? I did see out there that there are other uh, guilds that send, um, you know, over what their activities are. They come and participate in your, there's a lot of crossover that I've noticed. Uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about that? We have participated with uh, other guilds mm -hmm. through um, an invitation from the De Young Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in the early 2000s. And they had some kind of Friday night program. And we used to share the space with the San Francisco Guild. Mm -hmm. And it was just more like a trunk show. We would have quilts laid out. If anyone asked, you know, questions, we could demonstrate it, do a little demonstration on how we made the quilt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done that with them. Uh, we're now doing something with AMLO. But, that, you know, that's about all I could think of. Think of. That, that's that's still enough because you guys do everything else along with that you know that that's that's really a lot um that was one of the reasons why i wanted to showcase the oakland guild first is because um i feel that you folks are kind of setting the standard or you have set the standard whether you know it or not um um having been military and traveled around believe me you 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 guys are breaking ground and doing things and this is why you are still here in existence and i know i keep using the word relevant but i think that's a very important word to describe a quilt guild if it's going to survive you know um but we're almost done here and um i have to ask about the future of African American quilt guilds, and can you share with me, or or do you have a um, some vision of um, what you think African American quilt guilds should be like in the future? If not, what would you want to see happen with your guild in the future? I would like to see us go back to having these mini groups. Mm -hmm. That's where you build relationships. That's mm -hmm. where you can make contacts with people outside of the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and and it just makes it more fun, more enjoyable to quilt, to, to mm -hmm. have a group together. Mm -hmm. I still go to the senior center uh, twice a week mm -hmm. and quilt with, I think there's maybe five of us who are AAQGO members. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't even take our projects out of the bags we're just sitting there talking and laughing oh, but you know just, just having just sharing just the social having part, fellowship but, yeah you know, where are we going to eat today you know? oh my goodness but that's but, what quilting is about you know that's part of our quilting that's part of our tradition right you know, that is part of our tradition you know that fellowship that coming together and sharing um so let me ask you um before we end can I get some closing thoughts? I mean, do you have any final thoughts for other African American quilt guilds? Are there any, um, what should I say, pieces of advice or wisdom that you would like to pass on? Well, I have passed on what little I know, and I know there's a group in Fresno that started probably 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. We have a mini group up in Solano County, and they're very, very active. Mm -hmm. uh, they're helping the Social Justice Sewing Academy every week. Uh, and I could give you more information on um, who leads that group. 
They have outside instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, just they're very, very active. Um, they're kind of a notch younger than I am. I used to attend their meetings, but yeah. it's like, oh, God, I got to drive an hour up and I got to drive right. an hour back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and it just got to be a little too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I will share that, inform that information with you. Okay. Um, they're just very active. And mm -hmm. I look at them, and that's what we used to do. We were mm -hmm. just calling each other. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to hang? Can I hang there? Can you know, just looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. And like I said, with COVID, and then with our age group, we have really slowed this slowed down um, mm -hmm. with our activities. But I would like to see that come about. My solution to that is to our a possible solution is to start the small groups again. Small groups uh, again. And yeah. and that I know those who are in the so and so's, we're the best of friends. I mean, we mm -hmm. go out to lunch once a month, mm -hmm. you know, just everything. We travel together now. We just do everything together. Oh, how neat. <laughs> how neat. I mean that, that's you know, that's 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 the quilting life. Mm -hmm. That's African American quilting at its best when you can say that and you guys have done this for years and years and years and i'm just awestruck by that because i've known guilds that have, you know they last a few years or you know people don't get along they fall out or or what have you and then then it just all goes away and um you know we we have to do we have to amend that you know and it sounds to me like the when the mission of the guild is about the community and about the members then you you don't have so much of that falling out it's not an i it, or a me it's a we and uh, and and that can keep you going um so can i ask you are there any is there anything else that you would like to share that i may not have touched on or anything that you would like to say you know, I can't think of anything until this is over. <laughs> okay, yes. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm going to have a dozen questions, Dolores, when this is done. <laughs> but as we close out, I just want to thank you so much again for sharing your knowledge and your experience and the history of the African American Quilting Guild there in Oakland. Um, our study group is conducting a nationwide project concerning African-American quilt guilds. And I will be reaching out to other African-American guilds in the future to see if they would like to participate also. Um, so uh, if this is out there to the audience there, if you'd like to know more about the African-American Quilt Guild in Oakland um, on uh, my website and on the Quilt Alliance website will be the uh, website and contact information for the Oakland Guild. And um, if you are interested in doing quilt documentations, my site will be there also. So again, I'd like to thank you. Oh, what a great interview. Thank you, Adana and uh, Dolores. And I will ask you, uh, invite you to uh, turn your cameras on and your mics on and join me. Let's see. Here's Adana. Excellent interview, Adana. Thank you. Such a good job. And Dolores, you you were uh, so generous with your the information that you gave about your own quilting, but also about the guild. And let me just say, I'm so impressed with your job, what you've done as historian of the guild. You have one of the most complete websites of any guild I've ever visited in terms of documentation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I was I'm happy to see some of those photos I took. <laughs> Someone's looking at them. <laughs> I was able to uh, pull all of the photos that I needed to provide, and I could have gone 
and been much more descriptive with uh, more of them, but what, what a great, that's unusual. I don't know if you realize that, but that's, that's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work, but you may not realize that most guilds do not have that complete an archive. And what, what was, what prepared you to be the guild historian? Did you, were you a historian in your work? No, I wasn't. Uh, I think that's part of Esther's influence, that you document everything you do. She had labels on some of the, on the backs of some of her quilts that told a whole story. Uh, one was I was cooking beans and the kids called me and I ran outside and they were doing this and this and then I could smell the beans burning and I ran back in. And it was just such a funny story. And whenever I think of Esther and I think of her documentation, um, to me, it, it just tells a story and, and I'm interested. And so I learned that from her right down. I have narratives on all my quilts or most of the quilts and they're just sitting in my computer. I thought, well, maybe one day I'll be famous and somebody will publish them as to why I made the quilt, where I got the idea. And I have just documented a lot of stuff. But I'm a person who likes to make lists. So that's part of my list making. I think that's what makes it powerful, don't you? That you include details that are not necessarily technical details. You took photographs of things that were not just quilts. You took photographs of people. Mm -hmm. And you took photographs of children's hands as they worked with the fabric. And the context of the school. I think those are all things that fill in the story of why you're going into the schools during Black History Month and at other times during the year, why that's so impactful. Um, you've really been able to tell that story. And and Adana, what, um, I, I know we've got other questions from the audience and we'll get right to that, but um, I'm curious about Adana, what made you, what made it motivated you to, because you're a quilt historian and you're um, going about documenting African-American quilts themselves that have, that are owned by uh, folks in the communities that you're visiting, but also what motivated you to want to document the guilds themselves? Well, I had uh, started off documenting uh, just African-American quilt makers. And uh, once I moved to the San Francisco area, I wasn't sure how I was going to continue to do that since I was, uh, my home base was up in Washington state. But once I uh, moved here and got involved with the guild and saw uh, what they were doing, it, I was just amazed uh, at all the activity that they had going on. It's not just one thing once a month. It's many things every month. Yeah. And um, it, it, I was impressed. I was impressed. I uh, had been working on my plans to, to um, start up a nonprofit, the African American Quilt Documentation Study Group. And it mainly is to document uh, the legacy of quilt makers. Um, and family quilts, um, quilt, um, uh, any anybody that had their own quilt collection. However, um, we do do other projects. And I thought that this would be a great project. Um, the word I'm looking for is inspiration. Um, right. Listening to and um, having participated in some of their activities, it was so inspiring and I just, felt that that needed to be shared. And so I'm going to continue to do this. I'm happy that we're, we're able to share and be a part of QSOS with the Quilt Alliance so that we are able to continue to do these and bring more stories that we can share, not just with the African-American community, but the quilting world as a whole. Yes. I think there's so much so much to be inspired by in mm -hmm. the example of the uh, African American Quilt Guild of Oakland, and also in in your story, Dolores, and what how you have uh, the roles that you've played. 
And I've got some, uh, oh, if there's some questions here in, and I've got some more questions, but um, Janine asked, does your guild welcome drop-in visitors to meetings? I'm in Oakland every few months visiting my son and would love to connect. Certainly, we meet the fourth <laughs> Saturday of the month, except for December, at the West Oakland Library. The meeting begins at one o'clock and all visitors are welcome. Filters, oh, nice. non-filters, all visitors are welcome. So nice. Um, you mentioned the power of small groups and that there are some groups working with other, partnering with other groups like Social Justice, Social Justice Sewing Academy. Mm -hmm. If you, um, if someone came to you, um, a young person or not a young person, but anyone who wanted to start their own guild, specifically an African-American quilt guild, what would be your advice to them in terms of, I don't know, dynamics, organization, history, how to document? What, what's your advice to someone starting in a guild? Well, I have two experiences doing that. There was a a person, I don't know how I met her, but she lived in Fresno. I think I met her at the golf course now that I think about it. But, <laughs> and we started talking about quilting and she wanted to start a group. And so I was able to send her, uh, you know, our bylaws. I told her we copied our bylaws from someone else. And then every year you refine them. Uh, explained to her how to go through the process of getting the nonprofit status and why you want to do that. In fact, I did this with Sacramento, a Sacramento group also. Um, there's a group uh, up in Solano County, the Solanos. And Terry Green was asking me how, you know, I, wanted, I want to gather people together, uh, you know, to do these things. And I told her, start a group. Just put up a flyer, start yes. a group, and you'll find like-minded people. I mean... Um, I'm surprised that some of the people that I had gone to school with um, were quilters. Someone I had gone to junior high school with, I saw her quilt hanging at a place and I wrote her a note saying, oh, you know, I like your quilt and I'm a part of this group that just started. And, you know, it's like we're still back in junior high when we get together yeah. now. <laughs> um, you know, you just find people. <clears throat> Well, could you tell us about the quilt behind yeah. you? Oh, this was is my husband's quilt. Um, it was made in about 1939 by his grandmother. And you could see some of the red patches. My husband believed that that was his grandfather's shirt. He was about five years old then, and he was able to use the big scissors, as he called them, to cut squares. And I can't imagine a five-year-old with these big scissors cutting squares, but he said his grandmother told him if he wanted the quilt, he had to help make it. He lived in Dallas and every summer, his parents would send him to Minden, Louisiana to the farm, uh, probably to get out of the way. <laughs> so, um, they used to, he said he would take this on the bus and I can't even imagine a five-year-old riding 200 miles on a Greyhound bus by himself. But he said, oh, it started when he was like maybe four, three or four. They would bundle him up, wrap him up in the quilt, put him on the bus, and at the other end, the grandparents would find him. And then when school was starting, they'd pick him up and take him back to Dallas. So this was his quilt. And um, maybe 30 years ago, I found it at his mother and father's house. And I asked, could I keep it? And they said, yes. And I lost my husband three years ago, but he would have a fit when I would take this quilt out of the house. I mean, I almost had to sign a contract. I'm going to bring it back. Wow. And I told Adana when she was documenting the quilt, as I walked out the door, his ashes are on the mantle. And I turned around and said, I'm bringing it back this afternoon. You know, That's how much he protected this quilt. <laughs> so... I had to tell him, I'm bringing it back this afternoon, you know. <laughs> what a great story. And I mean, quilts have lives that no yes. one would know about. Yes. There this are one is full of life. And since I took it out and kind of aired it out, 
uh, I threw it over myself the other night and just felt really at peace. Wow. The other incredible thing that mm-hmm. quilts can do. Well, what is next on the schedule for you and your guild? What's, what's coming up? Oh, I <laughs> have 35 quilts off in my living room that we will be hanging at the Hayward Area Historical Society Museum uh, February 8th through April. And then I have another pile of quilts belong to the so-and-sos that I'm accumulating quilts because we'll be hanging at the Hayward Library from February through April. So those are the, the big two projects we have for the, well, for the guild. Mm -hmm. Just a couple things. Just just a couple of things. (laughs) Adana, what's coming up for your organization, your work? Are you interested in having um, people connect with you via your website? Uh, Yes, we are. Um, It's been busy. It it really has, but uh, it's all good. It's all in fun. at the, uh, if anybody is interested, um, if any African American guild or quilting group or individual is interested in having the legacy of their family quilts or their own collections documented, they can go to our website at aaqdsg.com and fill out a contact form. Uh, we'd love to hear from them. Um, the legacy documentations are totally free at no cost to the individual or the guilds. Um, and as we are a nonprofit, we do operate solely based on uh, donations and grants, but we're glad to do that. So that's going to be ongoing, uh, along with doing um, what I have come to call um, sewn narratives that bind, and that is the African American Quilt Guild. So I will continue with a series of that, along with, um, um, I am working with uh, Berkeley, uh, doing some consultation, and they plan on having a big exhibit next year in 2025. And we're in talks now, uh, discussing doing documentations uh, leading up to the exhibit. And I have a few other exhibits that are coming um, that we may be doing uh, documentations around the United States at the opening of other exhibits. So, Oh, my goodness. So just a few things. Here. Just a few things. Yeah, just a few. So impressive. Both of you, thank you so much for being a part of this program today. And we're so proud to have your interview in the QSOS collection, Dolores. And we'll be sharing this recording and also a link to the um, interview. I also want to mention that Quilt Alliance is a membership organization as well. Please consider joining. And we have a podcast that uh, draws from the QSOS collection. So check that out. It's called Running Stitch. Um, Thank you both. Uh, I will say next week, uh, next week's textile talk Sounds really interesting. It is with the Brown Grotta Arts Contemporary Art Gallery. It'll be presented by Sakwa. And uh, thank you all for being here today. I hope you can join us again next week. And I'll turn it over to Lucy so she can let you know again who our sponsors are for this series to keep it keep it free and uh, to keep this series going. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.